Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Graham Bart. I'm the Executive Director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this seminar, whether you're here in the room with us at Westminster College or whether you're joining us online. Um, a very warm welcome to you all. So um, this is our second research seminar of 2024. And um, just a few very quick housekeeping things for those who are in the room. Uh, if there's a fire alarm, then uh, please assemble outside. The exit is back to the door where you came in. Um, toilets, if you need those down the corridor this way on the right. And, um, and just to know, we, we have a bookshop you can see on the shelf over there. Um, we can take credit cards and that'll be available after the seminar if you'd like to make use of that. Um, we're going to have some time. Uh, hopefully the questions after the seminar and um, obviously for those in the room, that's the opportunity to ask as a person, anyone online, if you could type your questions into the Q&A field in, in Zoom, that would be great, um, rather than the chat. Um, and then you can do that at any time uh, during the, 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 the seminar. So I am extremely pleased today to welcome Professor Martin Darwin as our speaker um, and Martin is going to be talking on the intriguing topic of Kepler, Galileo and aliens <laughs> um, and just by way of uh, by way of introduction short introduction uh, so Martin is professor emeritus of mathematics at the University of British Columbia he took a BA in maths at Cambridge University and a PhD in probability theory at the University of Wales uh, he then returned to Cambridge for 12 years before moving to the University of British Columbia. The main theme of his research has been the behaviour of uh, the behaviour of random walks and diffusion in irregular, random, and fractal environments. Since his retirement, being back in Cambridge, uh, he has renewed an early interest in existence of aliens, in the Fermi paradox, and in the history of Western thought on this topic. So without further ado. Over to you. Thank you. Okay, right, there we are again. Right. Okay, so my talk is Kepler Galileo Aliens. <laughs> and here are the three and a half questions that we will uh, talk about. Yes, which one is which? Um, and here's a brief outline of the talk. Um, we're going to have some preliminaries. I get to talk about the background to their work, which is the Ptolemaic and Copernican systems and um, Bible descriptions of the Similar system. I'm going to talk about a bit about Galileo and Kepler and their lives um, and what they thought about aliens. And then, if I have time, I'm going to go on to talk a bit about John Wilkins, who is the author of the first popular book in English written in 1638, Aliens. And then finally, um, we'll have some a summary and sort of speculations. So, a little bit about me, as Umbrella has already said, most of my research has been in political theory. But as he said, I've always been interested in this question. Um, after I retired from University of British Columbia in 2018, I started reading in this area. Um, and my historical research began by reading two excellent books written in the 1980s by Dick and Crow, which give a splendid overview of um, uh, what people thought, um, which is much more than a naive person would expect. Um, and then go on to look at least some of the primary sources, and I'll be talking about some of those. So let's just, my title was deliberately anachronistic, and you don't normally think of aliens with respect to Kepler and Galileo, and in some sense, in a linguistic sense, that's completely correct, because the English word alien um, has existed for a long time, but it means stranger. And it's used to denote intelligent beings from another planet would seem to date from the early um, science fiction stories in the 1920s. Um, as we will see, the concept is much older, but writers used a different vocabulary. They would talk about inhabitants or residents of the moon um, rather than um, aliens. And th the question of the existence of intelligent beings elsewhere has been debated for a long time. Um, you can find it going back to 1200 or so. Um, but a, and a common term used to describe the debate was plurality of worlds. 
So we think of world as meaning planet, but it also means a planet with plants, people, and so forth. So a plurality of worlds would mean there's more than one world. In other words, there's more than one planet with intelligent beings. And a pluralist believes there's more than one inhabited planet. And if you're summarizing the debate, it's very convenient to be able to talk about pluralist or anti-pluralist rather than people who believe that there are intelligent beings elsewhere in the universe and people who don't believe that there are intelligent beings elsewhere in the universe. There isn't a modern term which is quite as concise as pluralist. So just a bit of a background. Um, we can think about what hard and easy concepts in science. And my idea of a hard concept is that it's, it has some of the, or all of the three, these three characteristics. It requires a major conceptual need to arrive at the idea. Once the idea has been arrived at, it's still difficult to explain, and people find it difficult to accept. And an easy concept, not hard. Since we've got three criteria, we can also score things out of three. So let's look at some examples of that. Um, I think the classic example of a hard concept is Darwin's theory of evolution by naturalist selection. People could see the need for evolution, but they couldn't find a mechanism for a period of, you know, 50, 80, 100 years. Darwin said after writing his book, he thinks he must have been a very bad writer because almost nobody understood um, what he was actually saying. And there are numerous misconceptions about what Darwin actually um, said. And of course, as we know, people find it hard to accept. An intermediate concept might be Maxwell's unification of electricity and magnetism. I think that required a major conceptual leap. And it, and it was, well, where it was difficult to explain what I don't know, not to people with a knowledge of the appropriate mathematics. But as far as I know, there was no problem in accepting it. Once Maxwell had published his paper, people say, ah, at last, now we understand how the two things are linked. So easy could be thought of as pejorative, but I don't want to um, you to think that I think that. Um, and I think Frick and Watson's discovery of the structure of DNA isn't hard, it doesn't satisfy any of those three um, criteria, but I'll, if we biologists who wish to dispute that, well, they can. So for me, I, I think I'm not alone in thinking that, the, thinking that the idea of aliens was hard. It was something which was difficult for people to arrive at. And my thinking was perhaps um, summarized in a way by um, an article written by Carl Sagan in 1987, what he called the anti copernican conceit. And this shows ostensibly a number of stages that people go through, start, starting by believing that the Earth is at the center of the universe, humans are the most important beings in existence and so forth, and gradually by a reluctant succession of stages um, in the face of produced by evidence um, to realizing that humans are unique. Um, but if you look at that sequence, um, I think you can see that in fact it's problematic, um, and here are at least two ways that it's problematic. First of all, what would somebody who rejects four but number five believe? So we are the most intelligent creatures in the universe, but we're not the pinnacle of creation. What does that mean? But he's presenting it as a stage that people surrender for and agree with five. So what would people, what would those beliefs do? But more, fun, more significantly, I think while well, all of these beliefs, except possibly number three, have been believed by some people at some time, the sequence is not an accurate history of Western thought concerning aliens, and we will see some um, evidence for that later in this talk. Now, this is the Institute for Science and Religion, so I should say a little bit about theology here. And many people who don't know much about Christianity assume that the main challenge to the existence of the existence of aliens opposed to Christianity is that it would overthrow the idea of human uniqueness or supremacy. And um, uh, we will see a little evidence for that, but mainly that has not been a problem. And a more significant challenge is to the Christian doctrine of the incarnation. Most Christian theologians have assumed it's unique. Um, of all the 20th 
century, there was very little theological thought, and what there was was done by astronomers and wasn't terribly deep, I think. Um, in the 20th, uh, 20th and 21st centuries, um, much rather more has been thought, and um, these people, Tillich, Maskell, C.S. Lewis, are considered it in the 20th century, the middle of the 20th century, and more recently, David Wilkinson and Andrew Davison from Cambridge have been books on this topic. So I'm going to leave these theological questions to one side. Uh, if, as I think is possibly the case, there are no aliens at all, then the theological questions can be um, put on one side. So now let's start on the history. And the Ptolemaic system was a description of the universe. I'll show you the picture in a moment. It was formulated by the astronomer Ptolemy, who lived in the early Christian period. In his work, um, the Almagest, sorry, we seem to have a video which we can't deal with, I think. It gives a good description of the notion that planets are seen from Earth. And for most people in the period when it was believed, it was combined with the physics of Aristotle. So on one hand, it was a mathematical model of the motions of the planets, and it was combined with the physics of Aristotle. The two things didn't completely match, but um, people were on the whole were sort of reasonably happy with the sort of juxtaposition. And the principal features of the Ptolemy system, the Earth is a sphere, it's stationary and at the center of the universe. All the planets, the moon, the sun, and five planets, um, the really we were learned about then, all are carried around the Earth by a system of rotating transparent spheres. The stars are fixed on an outermost sphere, which rotates around the, the Earth every 24 hours. And beyond the outermost sphere, well, there are different views nothing, an infinite void, or heaven. And according to Aristotle's physics, Everything outside the Earth's atmosphere is made out of a fifth kind of matter. He, Aristotle recognized on Earth, um, Earth, water, air, and fire. The fifth kind of matter is not present on Earth, but it's eternal, perfect, and unchanging, and moves naturally in cells. So anything outside the Earth's atmosphere is eternal, perfect, and unchanging, and that's no good for physical aliens. So this Ptolemaic Aristotelian universe had all of them anywhere for physical aliens. And here's a picture of the Ptolemaic universe um, in a book ju written just before Copernicus's um, uh, book. And you see the Earth at the um, center, and then a collection of spheres. These are the spheres, the stars, and then the couple of outer spheres. Um, and then outside here, it says um, the habitation of God. So it, Appian would have seemed to have adopted the view that outside the outermost sphere was, in some sense, heaven. Now, there's one misleading feature of that picture, which is it shows all those spheres tightly clustered together. People didn't worry about the scale, but if we look at the Ptolemaic universe to scale, this picture, produced by Brandon Rhodes, is somewhat better. You see the outer solar system done according to scale. The little red fuzz is the sun, and inside the sphere of the sun would be the spheres of Venus, Mercury, and then the tiny little dot in the center is, is the Earth. So although the Ptolemaic universe was, of course, a lot smaller than our knowledge of the current universe, it was still pretty big, about 20 million miles across. Well, the Copernican system was introduced by Copernicus in um, 1543, and the main change he introduced was the sun is now at the center, so it's called the heliocentric um, system. All the planets go around the sun, the Earth rotates every 24 hours, and the moon exceptionally goes around the Earth. The stars are fixed still on an outermost sphere, um, which has to be at a huge distance from the sun, because as the Earth goes around the sun, if it was close by, we would be able to see that the stars change, and we don't. But epicycles, which are a feature of the Ptolemaic system, are still needed to explain the motion of the planets. If we go back, um, these little circles, with the blue dots are the planets, and they're carried on a smaller circle, an epicycle, which rotates around so you get a combination of two circular movements or more circular movements in the Ptolemy system. So Copernicus still needed epicycles. 
And here is a picture of the Copernican system, again, not to scale. <clears throat> so in the period between 1543 and 1610, um, there was, a, in principle, a debate between the Ptolemaic and the Copernican systems. Um, few astronomers accept the, the physical reality of the Copernican system. It was recognized as being more convenient for some calculations than the Ptolemaic system, but in the debate, there was no decisive evidence either way. And Copernicans had an uphill task in dealing with the common sense objection to um, the Earth moving, which was, if the Earth is rotating so rapidly, several hundred miles an hour, anyone could work that out, why don't we perceive its motion? Remember, people in those days had no experience of rapid, calm motion, sitting in a plane or something. Um, they would ride on horses, but that was, Aristotle would call such motion unnatural and violent, and riding on the horses sort of, in that sense, natural, unnatural and violent. And you don't sort of notice the, the sort of calmness. You can't pull yourself a car, probably while well riding a horse mm -hmm. easily. So, a couple of innovations in the Copernican system in this period. Um, actually, I think it may be the wrong digits. Anyway, Adidas and Giordano and Bruno abolished the outermost sphere and allowed the stars to recede into infinite space. So Ptolemy had to have his stars on the sphere because they were rotating at incredible speed around the Earth. Copernicus kept the sphere, but he didn't need it. Now that the stars are stationary, you can just have them going on out into the space, um, indefinite space. And Giordano and Bruno advocated an infinite universe of inhabited worlds. And as we know, he was executed in. 1600, yeah. possibly for believing that, but also for believing lots of other obnoxious things, according to the Catholic Church. Here is Tycho Brahe, um, who was the principal observational astronomer in the period between the Copernicus and Galilee. Um, he made incredibly accurate measurements of the positions of the planets by naked eye. If you look at the full moon, he could measure. Um, uh, positions to win within one thirtieth of the um, uh, diameter of the full moon. And he introduced a third called Tychonic system, keeping the Earth at the center, but the moon and sun rotated around the Earth, and the remaining planets rotated around the sun. So, apart from what was stationary and what was moving, it was essentially equivalent to the Copernican system, but it avoided problems about the Earth moving and so forth. And according to taste, the Tychonic system was either an elegant compromise between Ptolemy and Copernicus, or a system which combines the best features of both. So now let's go on to our main protagonists, Kepler and Galileo. And here we are again. So Kepler had a shorter life than um, Galileo. <coughs> um, he was educated at Tübingen, and then he was a lecturer at Graz from 1594 to 1600, and then he got a major promotion who was made imperial mathematician to the Holy Roman Emperor, and that was for the rest of his life. Galileo was born in Pisa. He was a professor in Padua um, from 1592 to 1610. His spectacular work in 1610 led again to a promotion, and he became mathematician and philosopher to the Duke of Tuscany, a position which he held, I think, for the rest of his life. And due to unfortunate Incident with the Inquisition, he was house imprisoned at his Verona, Florence, from 1633 to his death in 1642. So let's now look, that's a brief sketch of the two people. Now let's look a little more detail at Galileo. He was the son of Vincento Galileo, a Lutonist and musical theorist who did a fundamental work on um, the relationship between the tension in the strain and, and the pitch. Um, so Galileo learned a certain amount of applied mathematics from his father. From 1592 to 1610, he was professor of mathematics at Padua, and he did research on mechanics. Let me just say that we think of us Galileo as an astronomer who also did research in applied mathematics. Um, it might most of his research time though was actually spent um, looking at applied mathematics. And we might think of him as somebody who worked in mechanics who had a sideline in astronomy. But sometime before 1597, 
he became convinced of the physical reality of the Copernican system. He was never interested in the technical aspects of epicycles cycles and so forth. And he also became convinced of the falsity of Aristotelian physics. And I think that was one of his main targets of his life was to overthrow um, Aristotelian physics. And already by 1597, he was sufficiently eminent that Kepler, living in Germany, sent him a copy of his book, which I'll talk about in a moment. In 1608, a working telescope was developed, news spread rapidly, but early telescopes were poor optical quality and low magnification, and probably useless for most astronomical purposes. But Galileo saw the protection of the telescope. It's not quite clear why, because he couldn't have known ahead of time what he was going to find, and worked very hard to make an improved version. He made an improved telescope of magnification about 30 and began these observations in late 1609, and then he published his sidereal message in 1610. Right. Kepler to 1610. He studied under Michael Masley, who was one of the few astronomers um, living at that time who believed in the physical reality of the Copernican system. He was lecturing at Grants from 1590 to 1600, and did, he worked very hard. He did, wrote a large number of books on astronomy and mathematics. Mysterium Cosmographicum in 1596 advocates the Copernican system. Now, the Platonic solids, like the square, the decahedron, and so forth, are the most regular possible solids. And if you think for a bit, probably can't quite do it in the course of a lecture, you, it's fairly easy to see that they can be defined. So, Kepler found a relationship between the orbits of the planets and the Platonic solids, the solids were sort of fitting two orbits. So Kepler thought this was a beautiful um, example of, of symmetry and mathematics in the universe. Um, subsequent people, of course, but he was wrong, of course. Um, and Kepler's theory implied that there would necessarily be six planets because you've only got five Platonic solids. He sent the book to Galileo in 1697, the two very and in my view, unsatisfactory consequences. In 1600, he moved to Prague and was appointed imperial mathematician of the Grahe's um, untimely death in um, 1601 or 1600. And using Grahe's data, he completed the Astronomer Nova in 1609, which showed that the orbit of Mars is in the lips. Thus, dispensing for the first time in Western astronomy with their views. Kepler continued to think the Mysterium was his best book. Modern biographers of Kepler are a little ashamed of the Mysterium, um, and everyone recognizes the Astronomers of Nova as his greatest achievement. So, Kepler and Galileo were both early supporters of the Copernican system, so they should have been natural allies, but they had very different philosophies of science. Galileo was very much experiment driven, Kepler much more mathematical and speculative. Clear to me evidence of personal tension in their correspondence, we'll see some of that in a moment. And my guess is the root cause Kepler would write to Galileo and Galileo would respond was that Galileo viewed Kepler as brilliant but unsound. And if you're interested in the history of the phrase brilliant but unsound, interestingly, it seems to Due to Pucci Woodhouse. <laughs> um, so here's Galileo on the tides of moon. I'm more interest, astonished at Kepler than any other. Despite his open and acute mind, though he has at his fingertips the motion to Jupiter to the earth, he has nevertheless lent his ear and his sense to the moon's dominion over the waters, to all current properties and to such perimeters. So Galileo was wrong about the tides, and Kepler was. If not correct, more correct. Um, but you can see what Galileo thought there. So I think one could say that 1610 was the most dramatic year in the history of astronomy in terms of, um, I don't think any, any single year since then has produced such a revolution. Galileo published his sidereal message in March 1610, and he announced many discoveries, notably mountains on the moon and the four satellites of Jupiter. Others failed to see the satellites because well, perhaps they weren't used to observation with a telescope or because their telescopes were inferior. And 
Even some people who might have supported um, Galileo, like Meislin, asserted that Galileo was making fraudulent or erroneous claims. A copy of Galileo's book was sent to Prague, where Kepler was, and just before Kepler read the book, he reports a conversation with his friend Wacker, which was held after they heard rumors that Galileo had discovered new planets. Kepler was a bit disturbed because new planets around the sun would disprove his theory about the physical solids, and planets around the star would tend to confirm Bruno's theories and Kepler's work. So Kepler was actually very relieved when he read the Siderian message and found these planets were actually the satellites of Jupiter. Kepler was very frank. I mean, lots of scientists probably had the same feelings as Kepler, but they did not venture to express them in um, print. And Kepler sent a letter to Galileo on the 19th of April, and because lots of other people were interested to know what Kepler thought of Galileo's research, he published it on the 3rd of May as conversation with the Siderian messenger. He supports Galileo's observations, and here again we see a little evidence of tension with what Kepler says um, of some sort of personal tension between him and Galileo. And then, surprisingly, he goes on to assert that Jupiter must be inhabited. The only evidence he had is that Jupiter has four moons. And then but Kepler's argument is as follows. For whose sake do these four planets revolve around Jupiter if there is no one on Jupiter to behold this wonderfully aerial display with their own eyes? Or I do not know by what arguments I may be persuaded to believe that these planets minister to us who never see them. So this is Kepler's argument for um, inhabitants on Jupiter. And I call this what I call this the argument from utility. And we can outline the argument as follows. Nature or God makes nothing in vain. There's a Latin tag phrase um, which says the same thing. Anything which is of no use to a rational creature was made in vain. The moons of Jupiter are no use to us. So they must be for the benefit of some other rational creatures. And the most obvious example candidates would be rational inhabitants of Jupiter. <clears throat> well, I don't suppose any of you will um, assent to this argument. Um, in fact, we don't believe that Jupiter is inhabited, so um, uh, there's obviously probably something wrong with that. Um, this is Kepler's argument. Kepler was a genius, but at this point he was not producing a, a brilliant new argument. He was just saying what any or at least a great many people of his era would say. And this argument from utility was used many times in the following three centuries to argue for inhabited planets. Not notably by John Wilkins, who we'll come to in a bit, William Herschel, Thomas Chalmers, and David Brewster. And just to give you an example of a later use of this argument, mid 19th century, David Brewster was a very distinguished um, uh, experimental scientist who did fundamental work on polarization of light. Jewell wrote a book attacking the idea that other planets would have inhabitants, and Brewster argues that um, Jewell is wrong, and basically in this text, which I think I don't quite have time to read out, and this wonderful ro rolling 19th century um, rhetoric, the philosopher and the letter peasant have all rejoiced in this universal truth. Um, that Jupiter is inhabited, and he says, why should, could so gigantic a world have been framed uh, if not to give um, uh, a minister to the happiness of living beings? So we see this argument persisting in um, more or less the same form over a period of about um, two and a half centuries. But we don't use that argument today. Um, though you can find little traces of it. I came across, um, I haven't seen a movie of Carl Sliders Aiden's Contact, but the character Ellie Alloway, who is an astronomer, says, talking about aliens, if it's just us, seems like an awful waste of space, you know, the empty universe and just us. Well, that's really an appeal to the argument of the Um Sargon's a bit more cute, and I don't think you find that phrase in the um, uh, text of the book, but screenwriters wouldn't do anything. 
Why did the argument of utility fall out of favor? Well, the first is that many, perhaps the majority of scientists, perhaps not, are agnostics or atheists. The default position in science is methodological, methodological naturalism, which rejects any idea of purpose. Those scientists who are theists generally will think now of creation by laws and systems rather than by the direct manufacture of objects by the creator, which is obviously how we can imagine Brewster was, was thinking about the making of Jupiter. And the fourth difference is we no longer just value nature in terms of its usefulness to human beings. So now let's go back to Kepler. Later in his conversation, Kepler says concerning the inhabitants of Jupiter, for if their globes are nobler, Jupiter has got four moons, Earth has only got one moon, we are not the noblest of rational creatures. Then how can all things be for man's sake? How can we be the masters of God's handiwork? So here he is expressing the kind of difficulty that some of the claims of Christians have. But this kind of difficulty is actually expressed very seldom in the, in the literature. And much more common is the idea found, for example, in Wilkins, that the inhabitants of other planets may fill in the gap in the chain of being between humans and angels. Since angels are thought of as superior to humans, filling in the gap means filling in their finding material creatures which are superior to humans. Kepler rather neatly dealt with this difficulty by claiming that the Earth has got the best location in the solar system, because Jupiter, people on Jupiter couldn't see Mercury. Um, Kepler wrote um, an early science fiction book, The Sumerian. I won't the time now, I'll, I'll skip over it, but let me also say that as well as the argument of utility, he thought that the lunar craters were um, buildings constructed by the lunar heaven capitals to protect them from the long lunar days. From 1610, now let's go back to Galileo. In 1610, as a result of his fame due to his discoveries, he was made mathematician and philosopher to the Duke of Florence. He was elected as a fifth member of the Academy of Linces, which is the sort of early distinguished scientific society. Uh, he was forbidden to teach the Copernican system, but nevertheless, he did so in his 1632 dialogue, he was condemned by the Inquisition, and then was placed under house arrest, but continued his work in the campus. And unlike with Kepler, there's very little about aliens in his work. It's only perhaps mentioned four times in his works. And first possible reason is that this kind of speculation is much more dangerous in Italy than in Germany. But I also think that there was a genuine difference between the viewpoints of the two people. Kepler was mathematical and speculative. Galileo was much more empirical perhaps didn't like speculations, and did not want to waste his time on futile speculations. And we could think for a moment about Darwin. Darwin's theories of evolution would obviously have a, an application to um, life on other worlds, but as far as I know, Darwin never discusses that question anywhere in his works. So here's Galileo's dialogue in 1632. Um, it's written in, in Italian. It's an invented conversation on physics and astronomy between Salviati, who is basically a mouthpiece for Galileo. All these dialogues usually have a character as a mouthpiece for the author. Simplicius, an amiable but stupid Aristotelian philosopher, and Sagredo, a clever nobleman, who is also occasionally a mouthpiece for Galileo. So you can see Simplicius is set up to fail, and he does. And but the topic of life on the moon comes up when they're discussing whether the moon is, as we saw, Aristotelian physics requires it to be eternal and unchanging. And Simplicius argues that all changes on Earth are for the benefit of humans. And then he says, of what use to humans could changes on the moon be? Unless you mean that there are men on the moon who also enjoy the benefits of changes, an idea which he immediately rejects. So he's using the argument of utility, but he's now turned it around and he's using an argument for contradiction as well. He's saying, if there are changes on the moon, there must be men to benefit from them. But it's impossible to put them in the moon, so there can't be any changes on How does Galileo respond to this argument? 
He says, I do not suppose that herbs and plants or animals similar to ours are kept in the And now, a sentence with a double negative. I do not see necessarily follows that since things similar to ours are not generated there, no alterations take place. And he goes on to say that the things there are so far from our conceptions as to be entirely unimaginable by us. So he's saying there are cases on the moon, but we can't imagine, imagine what they are. Why does Galileo introduce this topic? I think it's because he needs to defend off an obvious line he took. And later, a bit more clearly in his dialogue, he says that things on the moon are very different and entirely unimaginable by us. Um, no doubt this expresses his views, but the answer also closes down potentially awkward lines of questioning, saying it was like a witness from a, a crime saying, I just can't remember. <laughs> and life on other planets, even in this brief discussion, Galileo, I think, has raised a question which is still open today. If there is life on other planets, does evolution follow a similar course as that on Earth, or is it completely different? And people um, today sometimes summarize that um, debate by saying Google versus Conway Morris. I didn't know Simon was going to be the audience, but there he is. Uh, and later in the 17th century, the Dutch scientist Huygens argued that life on other planets would be similar to that on Earth. So we could also say that Galileo versus Huygens um, uh, sort of like in some sense anticipates that um, uh, later debate, of course, in much cruder terms in terms of understanding biology. Now, I've got a bit of time with John Williams. He was born in 1614. He was a Puritan and took the parliamentary side in the English Civil War. He was master of Worcester College, Oxford, where he assembled a tremendous talented group of um, natural philosophers and scientists. He married Oliver Cromwell's sister. He was master of Trinity briefly. He was a co-founder of the Royal Society in 1660. He made, in spite of having been married to the person who executed his father, Charles II made him a chaplain, and then he was briefly Bishop of Chester before he died in 1672. And he wrote two books on this one. And the first is, they like long titles in those days, The Discovery of the World in the Moon, or a Discourse Tending to Prove that it is probable there may be another habitable world in that place. This book, the first book on this topic in English, was reprinted a couple of times, um, or presumably pretty popular. And a brief summary of his book. There is no valid philosophical or theological argument against the inhabitants of the He uses the idea of accommodation to deal with apparently and Copernican passages in scripture. He then goes on to say that Galileo's observations show the moon as mountains, seas, and atmosphere, only one of which, of course, is actually the case. And then he uses the argument of utility to say that the moon is inhabited. And in his second edition, he gives a second argument for inhabitants of other planets, which explicitly rejects, sorry, it was a misprint there, um, human supremacy. Now, he says, there is a great chasm between the nature of man and angels. It may be the inhabitants of the planets of a middle nature between these. It is not improbable that God might create some of the planets, so that he more, might more completely glorify himself in the works of his power and wisdom. So there are two different ideas here. The great chain of being, which is that we can order creatures more or less from most august to um, least august. And the second claims that the perfection of the creation means that God should sort of not leave any things unmade. And this is, in fact, a very common um, feature of thought, particularly in the 18th century. But you'll see that by this um, in this passage, Wilkins is explicitly suggesting that there are physical beings on other planets which are superior to humans. So, I'm getting towards the end of my talk. I said just a little about three important early writers. Um, this is only the beginning of the discussion of the history of reality in worlds, which was then discussed very extensively um, after. 1610, particularly perhaps after the books of Wilkins and later Fontenelle in the 1650s. And there are probably many more references than have been noted so far by researchers in the history of science. Historians aren't necessarily looking at this sort of thing. Um, and I think you know, if you perhaps look at 
a large number of authors at the time. You might somewhere find um, a reference to it. I found a reference, for example, in a work by Ben Bunyan, which is not as far as I'm aware, the detective writing of this. And the second point of my summary is the idea of alien, aliens is easy, not hard. It's not hard to arrive at the idea. Um, people in general had um, bad arguments for believing them, but um, they did um, believe it. And the most commonly used argument in the period from 1610 up to 1900 for the existence of aliens is the argument of utility, which relies on the theistic or deistic worldview. Um, it's difficult to frame, despite what Brewster says, it's difficult to frame that argument if you believe that you're just a constructionist. So it's a completely atheist um, viewpoint. I'm going to end with a couple of speculations. Um, this is going long, far beyond the evidence um, that I presented with you, but I think if you look at the history of aliens in Western astronomy, you see that it's quite considerably one of excessive optimism. Astronomers from people the nearest available planet about which we didn't know very much with aliens. Once that was the moon, um, well, we had to give up on the solar system, but people still looking optimistically at um, planets around. Um, other stars in the, in the galaxy. Gradually, the progress of astronomy has pushed the nearest aliens further and further away. And while um, there have been waves backwards and forwards in terms of believing aliens are likely or are not likely, a uniform notion has been sweeping out of aliens to more and more distant places in the universe. So that's my sort of brief summary claim of what one sees if you look at the more general history of the subject. And finally, I want to um, give a speculation, which is the idea of aliens excites a lot of interest, but also strong opinions. Some people find the idea very attractive, and other find it, others find it very repugnant. And it's not quite clear why. Um, if there are long, if there are aliens in Andromeda galaxy, what is it to us? But nevertheless, it seems to relate to some deep level to some aspect of our worldview, but it's not clear to me how. A lot of writers think that it's a clear difference between a religious and a scientific viewpoint. But the history shows many strongly religious people, such as Kepler Wilkins, who advocated the existence of aliens. My guess is it's somehow more political, radical versus conservatives. Remember that Puritan terms of the day were actually radicals. And the existence of aliens is somehow seen as subversive to establish political, social, or religious structures. But why that should be, I'm not quite clear. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I have a burning question. You uh, mentioned the, the text from Wil Wilkins. Yes. You mentioned angels. Yes. I want to ask you about, I've been thinking about this for quite a while now. My intuition is that there is a correlation between people's imagination about aliens and their understanding of angelology and demonology. So the question I have is whether you have found any discussion in any of these writers about angelology and demonology no. in any writings whatsoever. Um, no, I have not. Um, uh, I, 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 I would not have said there was such a correlation, but from, from the little I know, I'm, I'm thinking you maybe have expertise somewhat earlier, um, in earlier periods than my period. In the sort of early modern period, you know, 1600 onwards, most many writers would have accepted the existence of angels as part of standard Christian um, apparatus. How important it was that it wasn't, I, I, I don't know. Um, so I don't, I have not discovered such a correlation. Um, actually, picking up on that, because in Kepler's Somnium, right? Yes. They have inheritance of. There are demons, and I was wondering if you'd encountered any other kind of thinking about what would aliens be like if there were any yes. within science. So, I mean, Kepler in his Somnium, there are demons who belong to the sort of that kind of being. There are also inhabitants on the moon, which he comments on um, mainly reptilian or serpent mind, um, which is obviously sort of physical um, beings on the moon. Um, but in most of the books that I've read, which have only been a you know, small number of, of things in the total literature, discussions of angels and demons sort of pretty much disappear um, from, from the literature. 
Um, yes, we've got another question over there. Thank you, I thought that was great. So um, I work with young people in schools. Yes. And um, they get enormous joy from considering this idea of aliens. Yes. As to people outside school, even though with the scientific process there is no evidence of them. Yes. Can you comment on why you think that is? Why there's no, you know, well, it's, it's part of the question that I um, mentioned. The idea is incredibly attractive to people. Um, and I'm not sure why. It, I mean, it, it doesn't attract everybody, but some people just get incredibly interested in the topic um, for reasons which are lie at some level, which I am um, not a sort of psychologist or sociologist, and that I don't know. Yeah. Um, we'll, just, we'll just sit with the observation that they do. <laughs> Um, I'll just we'll come to the break in the room in a second. But just a reminder to um, those of you who are online that you can post a question in the Q and A field um, in the um, in Zoom. Um, let's yeah, please. Have a question. I believe you said that you once thought aliens were rather likely. Yes, but changed your mind about that. Yes. I wonder if you could say more about why you changed your mind. Well, I was writing a paper. Um, it's rather curious, actually. I was writing a paper on the Fermi paradox, which basically says the question is if aliens ex can exist, they should have been in existence for billions of years. Um, they would have plenty of time to come here. So I was writing a paper on that. I discovered, um, in fact, I actually don't have to write conclusions to papers, but in some instances you do. So I had to write a conclusion to paper. And writing a conclusion to paper, um, I looked at three possibilities. They don't exist. The um, zoom hypothesis, I can't remember what the third one was, but I found myself writing um, that the, the they don't exist is by far the most likely, is the most plausible of the three. So it's a case where my opinion flipped and I noticed myself with opinions flipping as I was writing that sentence. Of course, it didn't make, it didn't flip instantly, but it was a sort of um, a change of view and I, I was actually conscious of that occurring. When I was in the of the business of summarizing the um, conclusions from that paper. So it's basically my reason for not believing them is firmly also lack of Cartesian two or three observations. Cartesian, Russian physicist, um, said we, we can look at civilizations in terms of their energy output. Civilizations transform high, I'm sorry, low entropy radiation into lots more high entropy infrared radiation. Any big civilization, according to the laws of physics, will be producing this. We don't see such things so far anywhere in the universe. Thank you. So we have got to go got a question at some point. Oh, okay. We cannot, I'll just do one question from online. Um, and then we'll come back to you in a second. Um, so yeah, the question is, did any of the scientists uh, that you've been talking about, these, uh, these historical figures, actually look proactively, I guess, look for evidence of aliens? Did they think, um, did they think about how they would need to go about it? The three people I've talked about didn't really. Um, Galileo was an interesting question. Kepler had four eyesight and four telescopes, and Wilkins didn't do any experimental science. So, um, but Kepler thought that Galileo's observations of craters showed constructions of buildings. Later, William Herschel um, thought he'd seen chases on the moon. He strongly believed in aliens. And there's a suggestion that one of the reasons he persuaded um, George III to give him a bigger telescope was that he thought that with a bigger telescope, he might be able to see the inhabitants of the moon. Nice. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, Dennis, we'll come back to you. Good point. Yeah, I thought you could just speak, actually. Maybe I'll try to. Yeah, no, you mentioned at the beginning that the, the theological questions were, um, well, the second in, in line was the incarnation. Yes. That's been a, a significant question raised by. So I was wondering, in case of people like Bishop Wilkins and Kepler and so forth, these Christian Christians, um, did they discuss this at all? And was it a problem to them? Did they discuss it? But I've only read Kepler's conversations. As far as I know, Kepler didn't. Wilkins briefly says the question, questions about their salvation, whether they're humans or the seed of Adam, I'll leave to people wiser than myself. <laughs> <laughs> so um, neither of those two, two did. Um, and as I said, all the theology I've, I've found, I mean, none of it is anything like as sophisticated as what we see from people in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, 
that people like myself or are meant to Yes. I think it was raised by someone called Robert Long. Like yes, I mean, not quite. That's in the state. That would be pre Copernicus. So, yeah, I started at Copernicus because you had to start somewhere. But this, surprisingly, these questions were already discussed in the late medieval ages by people like um, uh, Nicholas of Cluny, Cardinal Cluny, unbelievable. So, you might think that um, Copernicus is the start of everything. It's just where I start. Thank you. Have we anything to learn from the original peoples of New Zealand, Australia, South North America, or any other what we call primitive society? I don't know. <laughs> um, but I mean, it would be interesting. Uh, I don't know what they would say. Also, I don't know what people. You know, there's a long history of Chinese astronomy, Indian astronomy, and so forth. I don't know um, what um, those people um, would say. I think it's an interesting topic, um, but one which I'm completely um, incompetent to um, uh, handle as I don't read the original languages and I don't have 40 years of scholarship ahead of me to read all the books. <laughs> so uh, I had a question about. Um, just the, the reaction of the church yes. back in the time of um, Galileo and yes. Kepler. And obviously, you know, we know that we know about the extreme reaction or the, the, the rejection of the eccentricity um, that uh, resulted after Galileo's observations. Um, but what what sort of reactions were there, if any, to um, uh, both Galileo and Kepler are featuring these ideas in their, in their books. Uh, I mean, did anybody really care at the time? Was it? Well, I think you, there's, a, there's a bit of a gradient between North Europe and South Europe, um, um, between Protestant countries and Catholic countries. But the condemnation of um, Copernicanism by um, uh, the, the Catholic Church in 1516 or thereabouts sort of inhibited a lot of discussion in, in, in those countries. Um, but Wilkins was a bishop of the Church of England. Um, nobody seemed to worry that he'd written a book um, uh, advocating the existence of aliens. So in some of the northern Protestant countries, there was obviously a much more relaxed um, attitude to these things. There was still sometimes a debate, but the argument of utility really tied the hands of um, the opponents of the existence of aliens. They accepted the argument of utility. So if they wanted to argue against aliens, they also had to argue against most of the discoveries of astronomy. And um, so they, you know, they were they were in some sense the forerunners of the you know um, young earth creationists of today. They couldn't accept the discoveries of Newton um, um, of astronomy, but say those are uninhabited planets. That wasn't an easy option for them. So they had to um, sort of, you know, throw out everything. And of course, that weakened their position in arms. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, okay, any more questions? Yeah, um, I think I'll... Well, thank you for your talk. I wanted to ask something about the utility of the universe and, uh, and development towards uh, inhabiting of Mars. Which we believe for a long time, if there are aliens, there would be a Mars. Yes. And how it actually happened? How did it happen? Because is it that we still don't want to abandon the idea of the universe being created for humans? And Mars is probably the, the only planet we can, can somehow inhabit by ourselves. So we are still trying to think, okay, the universe is too big. There might be some aliens somewhere. But at least this solar system is ours. Do we still like, and what role technology play uh, plays in this discussion? I am, yes, I think that's a sort of large question, so I can't answer the, the, the whole thing. I mean, uh, among the people who wanted to believe in aliens, Mars was the last planet to be surrendered, and often, I think, with extreme reluctance. Um, you know, as late as 1960, um, in a book by Shagan and Schlossby. Um, they they speculate on what people will find in, or that they come to Mars. 
they dismiss as uninteresting scrubby vegetation, which you would be amazed to find, and suggest that we have minarets or other interesting things. So, really, very late um, inhabitability of Mars was, was surrendered by the old Jesus. Um, and of course, there are people who um, look to colonization of Mars, um, uh, which is a pretty inhospitable place. But um, so my time. Um, okay, okay. And this will be our last question, I think. We're just running up to the top of the hour. Yeah. Well, most of the discussion, was, uh, like, certainly in those texts, is sort of conceived aliens as superior. You used the word several times. I'm uh, imagining this might be related to them being ethereal, um, so they are made of some element that is more perfect rather than unmade. So they bridge between humans and angels, they are superior, higher beings. Nowadays, when we think about life on other planets, we're thinking of looking for more to the bare minimum of what we would count as life, so single-celled organisms. Uh, how, at what point did this sort of transition happen? Was there a fragmentation? Were there some, did science go in one way and the enthusiasts go another way? How did that narrative yeah. again that's a very big that's a very big question i um i would say i mean if you look at wilkins um he explicitly aristotle remember thought there was a fifth kind of matter present in the heavens wilkins uses the argument of um economy occam's razor to argue that all about matter in the heavens is going to be the same kind as matter on earth so although wilkins doesn't go into any details on his aliens um, you know, they need atmosphere, seas, and mountains. It suggests that he was thinking of physical beings like us rather than any kind of ethereal being. Um, and I think Fontenelle, a bit later than Wilkins, thought the same way. Um, so, um, but of course, there's, there's a wide variety. All sorts of different thoughts have been had, and um, some native thinkers would have thought of people as, or aliens as being more ethereal. But, these early writers, I think, didn't. Wonderful. Okay, um, well, we are now at the top of the app, so we need to draw things to a close. Um, and uh, I guess thank you so much, Martin, for your um, really interesting, stimulating lecture. Let's show our appreciation.